Uh, yeah, I'll just uh, mention a few things. Uh, yesterday night, as I was working on these slides on the flight, a lot of memories of having worked on several papers and other things with Raghu came to my mind. Uh, I got to know Raghu when I had applied as a PhD student, uh, and due to some falling through the cracks, I hadn't made it initially to the Chicago program, and then Raghu got my application seen. Uh, but uh, there was a time when I wanted to potentially be in industry, so I chose to be in New York. Uh, but then over time, I kept reading uh, Raghu's work. Uh, and I remember my first, uh, one of the interesting interactions I had with another banking researcher was in a flight to WFA conference. It was my first conference. Uh, I was in the plane, I was working on my thesis on systemic risk, there was bank A, bank B, some game was being talked about. Uh, and this banking researcher who was next to me, he looked at me and said, Regu Rajan. Uh, and I said, so I looked across the aisle, I thought maybe Raghu was sitting on the other side, I had missed him completely, so I looked, he wasn't there, so I turned to this gentleman and said, I don't think he's here. Uh, so then he looked at my notes again, he said, uh, banking, uh, crisis, Indian. Uh, he said, are you sure you are not Raghu Rajan? So uh, that was the day I realized that, uh, you know, if I had Raghu as my role model and if I sort of hit even 5% or 10% of that, I could very easily pass off as poor man's Raghu Rajan in, in flights. <laughs> uh, but uh, Raghu has truly been a big source of inspiration for me, uh, perhaps partly because I'm an Indian. Uh, I think I see many shades of uh, stuff that we had seen in the Indian economy permeating in Raghu's work, and uh, I think I can relate to it very easily. Uh, and so I think this is one paper that Raghu and I have been working together since 2009. Uh, it's happened mainly on planes. Uh, occasionally we've discussed it while running either on the Hudson River or in Chicago by the lake. Uh, some of it is still work in progress, but I think it captures uh, some of the issues of fiscal dominance and financial dominance that Marcus was also talking about. Uh, it's partly based on our earlier work uh, called Sovereign Debt, Government Myopia, and the Financial Sector. And the key, the key point here is government myopia. Uh, in a lot of models that we write down in macrofinance, government bonds are introduced as a way of fixing the market failures but these market failures are being fixed by a government that's assumed to be benevolent, very long-term in nature, etc. But I think it's fair to say that most of us who have studied political economy would think that that's not a very good description of how governments actually work in practice. So uh, our main departure from all of that is we are going to treat governments as having short-term horizons uh, and possibly also being populist, which is that they like to spend they like to keep spending for the part of the population that's likely to vote for them. And they have to do it in their current term in order to get reelected uh, in the next term. So we're going to study the implications of these things for the nature of sovereign debt issuances that one might see. Uh, and importantly, also understand what role is played by the financial sector when one tries to understand sovereign debt for myopic governments. So the key question is, is an old one. Uh, it's one that uh, Ken Rogoff actually worked very early on with Jeremy Bulo, which is why don't governments restructure debt even when long-term gains seem high? Why do they repay debt in the first place? Uh, and what leads to the entanglement of the financial sector with sovereign credit risk, which is sort of the new theme that has emerged, uh, especially from the European uh, banking crisis that we've seen in the last few years. So the explanations proposed in the literature uh, have been two so far, and we are going to employ both of them in some ways uh, in our work. Uh, the Bulo Rogoff and some other explanations were that maybe the reason why sovereigns repay even absent something like a bankruptcy code which seizes assets from the sovereign, uh, 
uh, is because they fear that they'll be excluded from debt markets for a long period of time after that. Now, for this kind of penalties to work in practice, so even when uh, the benefits from uh, not paying your external creditors may be very high, you can save the wealth internally, you need long-term exclusion. You need the government to be out of the debt markets for a long period of time. But what you see in data is that uh, defaulters uh, seem to return to international capital markets reasonably soon. In fact, once they have restructured their liabilities, when they come back to the borrowing markets, their costs of borrowing are also not that high uh, compared to, say, equivalent balance sheet uh, governments. At any rate, for this, even if you thought that there was long-term exclusion, for governments to take it seriously, they would need long-term horizons because they have to internalize that these costs are going to be suffered over a long period of time. Uh, and we are going to work with governments which don't necessarily have these long-term horizons because of election pressures and so on. Uh, then came an alternative explanation in the literature which is called the collateral damage to your own banks. Uh, and this is coming from the observation that rich industrialized countries don't just borrow in foreign currency separately, they're actually borrowing in their own currency, which plays uh, to some extent a reserve currency role, and foreigners are actually buying their bonds uh, in their own, uh, uh, in the currency of this borrowing government. Uh, and the idea here is that this market is so uh, intertwined with the banks of the own uh, country that if you signal even the prospect of default on your government debt, most likely it will lead to a banking crisis. It will lead to a crisis of confidence on your own banks. There are many mechanisms through which this could occur. Uh, uh, government debt could be collateral, important collateral in interbank contracts. Large repo markets could be existing on the back of uh, high safety properties of this debt. Uh, and at any rate, because the market is fluid, the uh, investors may not know how much of these bonds are sitting on which bank balance sheets and it could trigger a panic of sorts uh, on your banks. So uh, our explanation for why governments repay is going to combine these features but in the following way. We're going to start with the assumption that most governments care about short-term electoral popularity and they like to spend. Okay? They may not like to spend across board but they would like to spend for those who are going to vote for them. It may be the current generation versus the future generation, which is generally not voting. Uh, it may be a part of the current generation, which because of certain other attributes wants to vote for you, and you want to continue to spend to ensure that they keep voting for you. So the key property that stems from this assumption is that these governments care about current cash flows. They want maximum current cash flow so that they can continue with these expenditures for their vote bank. So they dislike default, uh, even if it is costly for, say, just one term or one period. Uh, and that's because default is going to lower the current cash flow because you can't default and instantaneously raise debt at the same time. So what these governments would ideally like to do is to figure out a mechanism through which they can keep borrowing so that their current cash flows are high and pass on the burden of repaying the debt to future governments. Okay, now usually whenever you have a mechanism like this, uh, in a dynamic game, it's going to unravel unless there is commitment at the end to repay this debt of some form. So where does that commitment come from? That commitment is going to come from collateral damage, which is that if the current government can also ensure that its debt is sufficiently entangled with the financial sector, then when future prospects of not being able to repay this debt come about, investors are going to be given the confidence that because a default on the sovereign debt is going to trigger a banking crisis, future governments are going to be very unwilling to actually undertake this sort of uh, lack of repayment. So investors in today's markets will continue to support the sovereign debt market as long as there is sufficient entanglement of the domestic financial sector with the borrowings uh, of the government. And so that builds a collateral damage or a punishment down the road which is going to ensure that this debt will continue to keep getting repaid by the future generations of governments. So let me illustrate some of these things with a simple two-period model and then I'll talk about some of its implications and what do we get when we take it to a fully dynamic setup. Uh, 
But the key message I, uh, that will come about is that it's going to be the myopia of the governments and their desire to sustain current expenditures, which is going to make debt, sovereign debt, sustainable in these models. There are times in these models when you would like the debt to actually be extinguished so that the uh, country has better long-run prospects and no debt overhang. But the fact that governments are myopic and want their current expenditures to be high is going to make, make the debt sustainable at the expense of long-run growth of the governments. Okay. So think of a country that is emerging from, an, from a big endowment shock, so it has become poor. This could be a commodity price shock, uh, a war, a financial crisis, uh, something of this type. And for simplicity, let's assume that to start with, the legacy debt is held by external creditors. So the domestic debt market or the domestic savings have not been high enough yet to build a government bond market in the first place. There's a private sector which can invest the endowment productively for the long run. It also has some short run payoff, but importantly, the investments that are made will also generate some wealth and growth in the long run. Uh, the savings, if in excess of these investments, will go into government bonds via a financial sector. And the financial sector, to start with, will just assume it has some home bias. So given a choice, they would rather hold government bonds of their own country rather than bonds of a foreign country. Uh, there's a government, as I said, will assume it's a short term. It wants to maximize spending on populist schemes. If you want, maybe it's United States government spending on housing. Uh, it could be other governments trying to create jobs, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, how do they raise cash to do these expenditures? Uh, they have two mechanisms. Uh, they can do taxation of the current wealth, current output, but they can also issue debt, which is going to be repaid in future, and therefore helps monetize the taxes which are going to be raised down the road. Now, the tax here is going to serve the following role. If you tax investments, uh, it's going to discourage the private sector from investments because their net of tax uh, returns are low. And indirectly, therefore, it's going to encourage savings, which through the financial sector will find their way into the government bond markets. So uh, you can, I can walk you quickly through the timeline. There is some initial endowment. Uh, the government can decide whether to default on this debt or not. If they don't default, they choose a taxation policy. Uh, and that taxation policy is going to determine the private sector investment and the savings. Uh, by the end of the term of this government, some short-term output is realized on these investments. Taxes are collected. Uh, and whatever old debt was there is repaid if there hadn't been a default already. Now, importantly, this uh, government, while issuing its new debt, uh, is going to choose the split of the domestic and the foreign debt, and I'm going to describe how that gets determined through this collateral damage channel. At the end of the period, a new government comes in. It could be the same government which has worked very hard through its expenditures to get re-elected. Uh, they are again going to decide whether to default on the previous period's debt or not, some taxes are collected on the long run output of investments uh, and the game ends in case of a two period model. Okay, so what's crucial here is uh, how does the domestic holdings of the government debt affect the total debt capacity of this government? So the assumption we are going to make is the following, which is that if you, if you had say $8 trillion of domestic uh, holdings of government debt and you signal a default on it, like say, like the situation we were in in the United States around August of 2011, there was fears of a technical default. No one was actually talking about US not going to the borrowing markets ever again. The only talk at that point was what implications will this have for the repo market that exists on the US treasuries, okay, and the agency debt out there. So our assumption is that any signal of a default uh, on this $8 trillion of debt will actually trigger a banking crisis, which is actually going to cost the United States some multiple of the size of this domestic debt. Okay, so let's say it's 1.25. So the mop-up cost of triggering a full run on the repo is going to cost about $10 trillion in this model. So rec recognizing this 
cost of a banking crisis, mopping up, uh, ensuring the payment uh, system is still in place, the banking sector is still uh, around after the default has happened, etc. The external creditors recognize that most likely they won't do something uh, like this in the first place. So as long as the total debt repayment doesn't exceed this $10 trillion, so the $8 trillion times this multiple Z of 1.25, uh, the United States government will do whatever it takes to ensure that the payments are in the end made to the external creditors. So this $8 trillion of domestic debt is going to sustain an additional $2 trillion of uh, foreign debt, uh, and that's because of this commitment that's coming through the collateral damage uh, channel that's out there. So the first period government, which is the myopic government, wants to build some debt capacity what is its game? Its game is that it wants to be able to issue debt in the market from external creditors, but to do so, it has to ensure that sufficient, of its, sufficient quantity of its bonds are also stuffed into the domestic financial sector, because that is what is going to bring the foreign creditors in. And the reason why you need to do this stuffing of the domestic financial sector is because this is what is building credibility for the future governments to repay. Okay, so this is a model in which the current government sets the penalties that the future governments are going to face if they try to default and restructure this debt. Okay, and the way these penalties are designed is through the stuffing of the domestic financial sector with your bonds. Okay, so in, in these kinds of models, usually you end up with two kinds of constraints. The second period government will either be uh, in the ability to pay region. In, this is the region in which the endowments of the economy are very large, and the only constraint on debt repayments is the solvency constraint, how much taxes can you collect in the first place. But you could also be in a willingness to pay region where there is enough to repay the debt, however, there is strategic value to actually not making the debt repayments, and that's because you can trigger a banking crisis, it's not going to be that costly, uh, so why actually repay these foreign creditors in the first place? So uh, depending upon uh, the size of the endowments, you may be in one of these two regions uh, in the end game in the second period. And it's interesting now to think about what is the objective function of the first period government depending upon where the second period government is going to be. Okay, so if in future the second period government will be in the ability to pay region, then the current period government will be able to issue debt against the second period taxes. Okay, so what is its total cash proceeds therefore? It's the current taxes and the debt it can issue, which is basically monetization of the future taxes. Okay, so even though this government is myopic, the debt has effectively lengthened its horizons. Okay, because they care about current taxes, which they can collect themselves, and the debt is a mechanism through which they are also monetizing all the future taxes that can be collected. So even though they are myopic, as long as you are in this ability to pay region, they are going to choose their tax policy as though they are effectively a long-term long government. But you might also be in the willingness to pay region where the debt capacity of the future government is not that high because there isn't much credible commitment. The domestic banking sector is not owning enough bonds to give credibility to the world that you're not going to default on this debt. So now perverse things happen because the myopic government wants to actually induce savings in the economy because it wants these savings to go into the financial sector and through the financial sector into holding domestic holdings of the government debt. So what does this government do? Instead of acting long term as in the first region, it's going to actually increase taxes tremendously and repress investments to boost savings, to boost holdings of uh, domestic holdings of the government debt and build commitment in the market to be able to borrow. Okay, so in particular, uh, when the endowments are very low, the tax rates will be very high. Let's just focus on the starred region. And uh, when the endowments are very high, you are in the ability to pay region and the tax rates are very low because the government is trying to encourage investments because if long run growth is high, you can monetize all of those taxes in the debt market in any case. But here they are trying to boost savings and the way you are going to boost savings is by repressing investment and getting this uh, savings into the domestic financial sector. 
Uh, and then the final calculation this government has to do is to whether it's going to default or not. Uh, and a biopic government in our model will default only if the economy is extremely productive. Because then the cost of repressing investments and getting the savings in is too high, and they would rather just uh, give up their debt uh, in that case. Okay, now it's interesting in, to, co to compare this to a setting in which you have a truly long-term government, even though that may not be a great description of the behavior of governments in practice. So let's say that you have a government that doesn't necessarily care about current spending. They are indifferent between current spending and future spending. Or in general, they discount future spending at some rate beta, which is less than or equal to the discount rate in the market. Okay, then it's straightforward to see in such a setup that if you have a long-term government which doesn't care at all between spending now versus spending future, then they always want to default on legacy debt now because that gets rid of repayments. And this way you have all the taxes that you can collect to do your populist expenditures. Big deal that you can't spend and raise debt in the current period. You can do all of this in the next period in any case. Okay, so. Uh, essentially, in a model like this, you get the outcome that short-term governments are going to engage a lot in economic repression. They're going to discourage investments and boost savings. And interestingly, it's the short-term governments which are going to have higher debt capacity. Because short-term governments will not restructure debt quickly. Instead, they will issue more debt to stuff their domestic financial sectors with and that will build the, repay, the commitment for this debt to get repaid down the road. So let me talk about uh, some of the implications of a model of this sort, where it's government myopia that's actually sustaining the sovereign debt market. So first implication, debt here is a double-edged sword. Okay? So in the first region where uh, the endowments are very high, you haven't had a large shock like a crisis that has destroyed big uh, domestic savings. As, as I was discussing earlier, access to a sovereign debt market lengthens the horizon of even a myopic government because it gives them a mechanism to monetize future taxes. And through that, they recognize that maybe it's good to pursue growth-friendly strategies because if we pursue growth, it will lead to expectations of future taxes and we'll be able to borrow against that in the debt markets today. So we'll be able to spend more in any case. Let's pursue a growth-friendly strategy. But if you get these sudden shocks which put, put you into this low endowment region or the willingness to pay region, now having access to the debt market is actually a big, has a big dark side. Because now these short-term governments, uh, rather than uh, pursuing low taxes, they will actually pursue very high taxes as a way of discouraging investments and ensuring that they can continue with their spending in the current period. Next, uh, this model has the implication that you could get overdevelopment of sovereign debt markets. So uh, the role played by the tax rate in the model is really of economic repression of investments. You could also think about governments uh, doing financial repression. Uh, historically, this is how one has viewed high liquidity requirements of banks uh, in the emerging markets. Uh, as soon as a deposit goes into the bank, 25% of it goes into funding the fiscal deficits. Uh, this is just an indirect way of uh, effectively achieving the same outcome because the deposits that are going into the financial sector are being channeled into the government bond market when you do this. Interestingly, governments can also choose how much to entangle their financial uh, sectors with their debt and what kind of entanglement they want to create. Uh, one very interesting implication is that, uh, though Marcus uh, provided one view, which is that banks may want to remain undercapitalized, uh, it's possible in setups like this that it's governments that want their banks to remain undercapitalized because if they are better capitalized, they may not actually buy their bonds. Whereas if they are undercapitalized, they will gamble for resurrection and buy even risky debt uh, uh, because that becomes a good carry trade for these banks to generate high returns on equity uh, as a way of potential gamble to recapitalize. So you might get an outcome in a model of this type where uh, 
uh, as you get these negative shocks where the governments are forced to create commitment to repay, you see a sudden increase in home bias of government bond holdings. Suddenly your domestic banks are kept undercapitalized and at the same time they are uh, encouraged through zero sovereign risk weights, for example, to buy uh, more of the government debt. Uh, let me skip this. Uh, and finally, some implications on the European uh, sovereign crisis. Uh, I already touched upon the failure to recapitalize banks. Uh, if you have seen the stress test outcomes in Europe until 2011, it's very clear that the stress tests failed because sovereign debt was not haircut. Uh, and therefore, banks which had tremendous uh, undercapitalization in a market sense, because the markets recognized the riskiness of this debt, uh, these banks were effectively allowed to remain undercapitalized and continue to buy uh, sovereign debt. Uh, so, uh, one might ask, what would be a way of breaking this mechanism, breaking the nexus uh, between the financial sector and the sovereign debt? And there's a very interesting proposal that we discuss in our paper uh, by the Bruegel think tank. So this think tank proposes two kinds of bonds, uh, blue bonds, blue sovereign bonds, which will be held by domestic banks, and they'll be guaranteed, say, if it's the euro area, by some central debt management authority, presumably through tax collections that are going to happen from the individual governments issuing these bonds. But there'll be another class of bonds called red bonds, which will be guaranteed only by the issuing country, and the domestic banks will be prohibited from holding these bonds. Uh, and I think the point of the proposal is that there'll be lack of commitment to repay the red bonds. Okay, and so if you limit the quantity of blue bonds to be those that are supported already by taxes paid to a central debt management office. Then the remaining bonds, which are red bonds, the investors will recognize that there's lack of commitment here to repay, and therefore the debt capacity won't be occurring at the expense uh, of extra entanglement with the domestic financial sector. In fact, you can take this proposal further. Uh, there have been reports in Europe which have suggested that we should compensate bankers with their unsecured bonds of their banks, which can get converted into equity. One could take the logic further, and you could compensate government officials in these red bonds, uh, so that if they try to excessively issue these bonds, the market prices will collapse, and they will be diluted uh, on their original holdings of these red bonds in the first place. Uh, let me talk in the last few minutes about uh, the dynamics that one can get out of this model. I'll just give a sketch here. Uh, so, in dynamics, uh, the second period is not going to be the end period. Each period government is doing exactly the same calculations as our first period government was, which is they want to issue debt, they want to uh, tax, and they want to keep spending as much as possible. Okay? But debt is going to be sustained because everyone wants to keep spending, as I described. So. Uh, as long as you have a productive technology in economy like this, the endowments are going to keep increasing, absent some negative shocks. And ultimately, in a stationary version of this dynamics, the economy will reach a steady state where the borrowing is constrained only by the ability to pay. And the outcome will be that in each period, the total tax you collect and the debt that you can raise is enough just to repay the legacy debt that you got from the previous government. And so in the steady state, each government is doing nothing except to repay the old debt, but they have to issue new debt and collect taxes in order to keep doing this. And the economy is, of course, going to evolve to this state, and so it's the transition dynamics which are interesting. So along the path to this uh, steady state, there are two options that the previous governments have to increase their debt capacity. One option is that they can keep low taxes and boost growth that hastens the convergence to this steady state and increases debt capacity. That's option two, actually, on the slide. Option one is the perverse option I was describing, where you engage either in financial or economic repression, uh, entangle your domestic financial sector with your debt, and through that you repress growth, but you do boost your uh, current debt capacity in the process. Now, uh, one result that comes out from a model like this is that you get something that looks like middle-income growth trap. 
uh, that you know that many countries once they reach uh, a level of endowment which one might call as sort of middle uh, income for their uh, households that they get trapped they, they they find it very hard to keep growing uh, sustain their growth uh, beyond these points so our, our our model offers a political economy explanation for this which is that when economies are poor uh, when their endowments are quite small, uh, they will optimally choose actually the option two, which is to actually invest in growth and give commitment to the market that we are going to hasten to this high endowment states very soon. Please lend us against those states. Uh, and once you choose low taxation, that's a credible policy that puts the economy onto a high growth path, allowing you to borrow more today in the markets. It's all being done to spend today but in this case, it turns out to be a growth-friendly strategy. But as the economies get richer, the growth slows down. Um, and endogenously now, the governments will start relying more on option one. Because they figure that by uh, low, keeping taxes low, there isn't much additional growth that's going to arise. So now let's use the repression technology of boosting our debt capacity. Okay, and optimally, it's going to be the case that this happens when the economies have actually generated some growth to start with. The last point, uh, you can then add some shocks and uncertainty in a model like this, and one can understand why sovereign debt crises might follow periods such as of great moderation more easily. So if there is some uncertainty about growth, uh, there can be defaults even within the term of current myopic governments. Uh, they will internalize the costs of these mop-up costs uh, that I was talking about. But if you are in a great moderation phase where the risks are perceived to be low in the short run, or they are low in the short run, and primarily loaded onto future governments, then the myopic governments don't have the discipline induced by the uncertainty to limit their borrowing. So they're going to borrow a lot at the expense of future banking crises, uh, and the mop-up costs will be incurred uh, down the road as and when negative shocks arise. So let me stop there. Uh, let me just summarize by saying, uh, I think this political economy view of uh, the fiscal uh, balance sheets, uh, how much governments are going to borrow, why myopia might make the debt sustainable, and why the nexus of domestic banks with the financial sector is very crucial to ensure that the myopic governments can continue to borrow. Uh, we think this is a promising way of understanding uh, sovereign debt crisis and sovereign debt capacity in the first place. Uh, as I close, I want to thank the organizers, uh, but more than anything, I want to thank Raghu for being a great friend, a wonderful co-author, and an unflinching supporter. Thank you, Raghu. Thank you very much, Viral, for this very interesting interpretation of the involvement of the local banking sector, the local financial sector, as a commitment device to repay uh, local debt, and also the political argument why local governments are not willing, not necessarily willing, to cut this link between the financial sector and national debt. Since we are a little bit running behind, we have room for two or three questions. Yeah, Bob. Maybe, maybe you wait for the micro, okay. Thank you. Uh, Bob Cherenko. Uh, given the endogeneity that you identify here, how should we think about risk weights uh, in a Basel type of arrangement or some other one? Or should we throw the whole concept of risk weighting out the door because it would be very difficult given this uh, introduction of the political system? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Uh, so I, when I was a PhD student, I, after my dissertation, I spent a month at the BIS, and I had asked some of them the question of where did the risk weights come from? And while there is all the statistical technology that goes into some of the determination of the weights, in the end they said there is a US central banker, there is a German central banker, risk weights on some assets hurt the Germans, risk weights on some assets hurt the Americans, and so we usually just have a race to the bottom. Uh, 
uh, to, to meet the various things. So uh, I think to some extent this pro process may be unavoidable, but I think this is where independence of the regulatory authorities could play a very significant role. I think they could lean against uh, the wind of uh, this uh, zero risk weights. Uh, to me, the European exercise in the stress test seemed particularly disappointing because presumably one needed a stress test because the regulatory capital requirements were not picking up which banks were vulnerable and which banks were safe. And so to do the exercise without actually changing significantly what your uh, regulatory capital calculations were, it completely defeated the whole purpose of recapitalizing the banking sector. But I think as I was arguing, maybe in the end, no one wanted to recapitalize their own banking sectors because I can guarantee that if Spanish and Italian banks have a lot of capital, they will not be willing to buy Spanish and Italian bonds because it's a very poor use of their equity to do that. I think as long as they have thin slivers of equity, it's, it's a very attractive gamble for them to do this. Okay, since uh, I do not see... <laughs> okay, <laughs> nobody else asking a question. Just one comment. No, no, the, I, the, the, the paper seems to be consistent with two facts. Number one, the governments in Europe with the highest level of debt are the one with the most unstable governments and short-term governments. So Italy and Belgium are the one with the highest sort of uh, debt and the short, more short-term government. Uh, the second is that uh, absolute monarchs used to default much more frequently. And so if you have a, not an infinite horizon because they can have a revolution, but a longer term horizon because you're stuck there, you are more likely to, as you said, get rid of the legacy debt and move forward if you uh, are facing election in the near future, then you're less likely to, to do that. One minor thing to this, which is so, so I think this, so this point gets raised often on our paper, which is that are you suggesting that democracy is bad, that we should actually go to <laughs> monarchs because they have longer horizons and they will restructure debt very quickly. But I think that's not the right comparison because you know monarchs will own the technologies directly themselves. Uh, and you know that's going to lead to much less uh, growth and proper redistribution in the end. But I think there's sort of one result which is interesting is that even with the myopic government, as long as the economy is sufficiently wealthy and growing fast, the debt actually lengthens the horizons because the debt is a monetization of all the future streams of cash flows. And now they're going to recognize that we could actually pursue a growth friendly strategy and the debt market will actually reward us for it because there's going to be more taxes down the road. So the key seems to be that you have to ensure that when you get these large shocks, such as say a crisis or a commodity price shock, that the technology of the economy has to be very high growth one because that is what makes economic or financial repression very, very costly, even to a myopic government. And so it says that the antidote to the political economy here is actually high growth. Now, of course, there may be a chicken and egg here, which is that sometimes generating high growth drivers requires the governments to make investments in the first place. But it seems that it's the growth problem that we have to solve in order to counteract the political economy problem. Okay, I think this was a very nice concluding remark on the first half of the session. I would like to stop here and propose that we come back at 3 o'clock sharp.